thousands being evacuated as a storm surge batters England's east coast. Gale force winds combine with high tides, bringing dangerous waves. With residents fearing the worst, the police, fire service and army are called into action. Our soldiers are ready, uh, willing and able to, uh, to get involved and, and help the local communities. Tonight, as waves breach sea walls, people are warned to stay away from the coastline. Also on the programme, under pressure, more NHS hospitals declare a major alert in England. Another Labour MP quits but claims it's not over Corbyn. And Lord Snowden, celebrity photographer and Princess Margaret's former husband, dies aged 86. This is the ITV Evening News with Charlene White. Good evening. Towns and villages along hundreds of miles of coastline from Northumberland to Essex are on high alert tonight. Predictions of a huge tidal surge has seen thousands of residents told to evacuate and the army has been called on to help. The Environment Agency has 17 severe flood warnings and 91 flood warnings in place, mostly along England's east coast. It's feared tonight's spring tide will be whipped up by gale force winds, putting lives in danger. Our reporter Ben Chapman is in Great Yarmouth, where evacuations have started. Well, people here are taking what precautions they can. Whether they will need them tonight will depend on the precise speed and direction of the wind at about half past nine tonight. That's high tide. And that combination will determine whether this town and others along the east coast flood tonight. It is a makeshift defence, but it may be all they can do to protect their homes. Those living close to the water are again relying on sandbags to keep it out. Residents in some 5,000 homes across Great Yarmouth have been urged to leave before high tide tonight. Daisy and her son Sanchez are among those trying to keep their precious belongings safe. Oh, we're staying here, we're going to stick it out as long as we can. <laughs> You're just going to hide upstairs, are you, and watch? Yeah, and hope for the best. <laughs> Starting at Scotland's northeastern tip, gale force winds have whipped up the water since first thing this morning. On the North Yorkshire coast, people and pets ignored warnings to stay away from the waves. For some, a soaking could be considered a lucky escape. But in Lincolnshire, it's the fear of a high tide combining with high winds that has led to soldiers bolstering its defences. We spoke to individuals, uh, we made sure that they had a plan uh, to, uh, to leave their property should, that, uh, should the situation deteriorate further uh, and we, uh, we just provided a bit of reassurance that the, uh, the security services were, were ready to go. In Essex, while some in the coastal village of Jaywick chose to ignore instructions from emergency services to evacuate, many heeded warnings their properties could be flooded by up to three metres of water tonight. A bit worrying really. Mm. We, we've only been here two years and it's the sort of first time we've had been warned to go basically oh. so it, it's a bit of a worry because you know I'm down here for a nice life by the sea but unfortunately <laughs> my daughter's come all the way from, Billy, uh, from Basildon to come and get me you know the house they all come last night so, so we've got to get going now in Great Yarmouth, the big fear is that the tidal surge tonight will swell the river that runs through this town. They know it's coming, the level is rising. What they don't know is how high it will get, and for a few hours more, all they can do is watch the water and wait. Well, away from the coast, snow, ice and high winds have been causing travel disruption across the UK. The hazardous conditions have caught many drivers out. One car overturned, as you can see, and a second slid into a ditch near Battle in East Sussex this morning. No one was badly hurt. Well, things aren't much better in the West Midlands. Drivers have been warned to slow down and take extra care on the roads for much of the day. And many schools, like this one in Greater Manchester, were forced to close today. More heavy snow is set to hit the region tonight. Well, let's return to Ben Chapman, who's still in Great Yarmouth for us. Ben, how worried are people there tonight? 
Well, they are worried because they've been here before. Three years ago, there was a tidal surge and it swelled the river and it flooded homes uh, in this town. It, it's not because they're worried about the waves crashing over the promenade like they may be in, in other places. It is very much the river level that they are uh, keeping an eye on. Now, uh, I've spoken to people today who are prepared to stay and, and sort of take the risk, move upstairs and just watch it. Other people are taking that advice to leave. The Environment Agency told me today that the best predictions they have at the moment suggest that it won't be quite as bad as three years ago. But this is a fickle thing. It all depends on the, the speed and direction of the wind uh, at high tide tonight. And no one can quite predict that. So I've seen uh, mobile incident units and fire service boats being brought in here. The army is on standby in the town centre. Emergency rest centres are being set up and people are being urged to take this threat very seriously tonight. Ben, thank you. Well, the all-important weather forecast follows this programme and there are more details on our website. New figures have revealed how NHS hospitals across England have been struggling to cope with the winter crisis. More than four in ten declared a major alert in the first week of this year as the system came under unprecedented pressure. 65 trusts raised the alarm over bed shortages and overwhelmed accident and emergency departments, as Sejal Karia reports. The inexorable pressure of winter is putting an enormous strain on the NHS. Today's figures expose just how acute that strain is and how the NHS is buckling under the burden. Brenda Mountford, who has dementia, has been one of its victims. She was forced to wait for hours on a trolley in a corridor at an A&E department in Oxfordshire. But her daughter-in-law, Amanda, said not before she spent two hours in an ambulance waiting to get into A&E. It was very cold in the ambulance. It was a cold, frosty night. She was complaining she was cold. They had to keep starting the ambulance up for the heaters. And her experience is far from isolated. Last week, four in ten hospital trusts in England issued major alerts as bed shortages worsened and a &E departments became overwhelmed. Six of them declared the highest alert, level four, meaning patient safety was at risk. Two of them in Bristol, three in Merseyside, one in Lancashire and two in the Midlands. Revealing the sheer scale of the problem, meaning this winter has seen a &E departments at their busiest for 15 years, with many doctors saying they haven't experienced anything so bad. Three or four things are causing it. First of all, we're becoming an older population. Secondly, we know that in some areas um, there are problems with social care. We also know that in some areas it's difficult for people to get uh, a GP appointment. So what happens is people who quite rightly want to be seen by a medical professional, they see the lights on in the A&E department on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so they go to the A&E department. What these figures show, and show starkly, is that the NHS in England is not only in crisis, but it's reaching breaking point. And although that strain is being felt acutely at A&E departments like this one, that huge pressure is also being brought to bear across the health service. With extremely tight budgets and unprecedented demand, many now say the pressure on the NHS is unsustainable. Sejal Karia, ITV News. Rolf Harris assaulted a 12-year-old girl standing inches away from her mother, a court heard today. The alleged victim told Southwark Crown Court that the entertainer then signed her an autograph. Rolf Harris denies assaulting seven women in attacks spanning 30 years. He's currently serving a sentence at Stafford Prison for attacks on four separate female victims. Tristram Hunt to quit as MP for Stoke-on-Trent today, triggering what could be a disastrous by-election for his party and leader Jeremy Corbyn. He's been an outspoken critic of Mr Corbyn in the past, but in his resignation letter, he insisted he didn't want to rock the boat. But as our deputy political editor Chris Ship reports, Labour will face a tough battle to retain his seat. He was once considered a potential future leader of Labour. Tristram Hunt parachuted into a seat in Stoke-on-Trent in 2010. He's now resigned, leaving his job as an MP for a job at one of the world's most famous museums. Well, I haven't lost control of the party. The party isn't out of control. 
The Labour leader was trying to sound calm about it all this afternoon. Tristram Hunt was no fan of Jeremy Corbyn, but in his letter saying he'd taken a job at the Victoria and Albert Museum, Mr Hunt avoided any direct criticism. I'm sorry to put you, the party and the people of Stoke-on-Trent through a by-election, he wrote. I have no desire to rock the boat now, and anyone who interprets my decision to leave in that way is just plain wrong. I don't want anyone to resign, I don't, I don't want to lose MPs, but he has uh, taken this position as director of the VNA. Good luck to him and we'll have a by-election. But despite that polite exchange of words, it means here in Stoke-on-Trent there will be a by-election. And this is a city which supported Brexit in the referendum and where UKIP was hot on Labour's heels in 2015. A great result in the general election where we got a good second place with you know candidates who worked hard and was perhaps under-resourced. Now. We're going to throw everything at this. This is going to be exciting. UKIP are going to come after this seat like never before. And in a city which has struggled since the decline of its famous potteries, voters had some advice for the sort of MP they'd like instead of Tristram Hunt. He didn't actually come from here, did he? I've actually joined the Labour Party this morning because Tristram Hunt's left, because he's got no idea of the local issues. It won't be any worse without him. Hopefully we'll be better. Maybe UKIP will get him. Tristram Hunt's resignation is the second in as many months. In December, Jamie Reid stepped down as the Labour MP for Copeland in Cumbria. A by-election is also due there. And Andy Burnham intends to quit as a Labour MP in May if he becomes the new mayor of Greater Manchester. What does that say about the state of the Labour Party and what they think of the Labour leader? Well, look, clearly we've got to look like a government in waiting and um, there are colleagues concluding that that's not the case and going off and doing different things. So how many more Labour MPs like Tristram Hunt will decide they want to do different things? Now it's true to say that Tristram Hunt is uh, an historian and an author and therefore a job running uh, one of the world's most famous museums was always going to be hard for him to turn down. That said, I've spoken to several Labour MPs today, some of whom say they too have had job offers outside politics, but they haven't taken them before adding not yet. So we could see some more. Whether any of this is a big problem for Jeremy Port Corbyn rather depends on whether he can win the by-elections that these resignations have triggered. OK, Chris, thanks very much. Still to come on the ICB Evening News, the PM distances herself from the British spy at the centre of the Trump dossier row. And the view from Basingstoke on Brexit Britain. I can see myself now buying a house and not struggling as much. Very up in the air, not knowing what's going to happen and how things are going to change. Those stories and more after the break. Welcome back. The Prime Minister today distanced the government from the former British spy behind the embarrassing dossier on President-elect Donald Trump. Theresa May said Christopher Steele hadn't worked for UK agencies for a number of years. Mr Trump called him a failed spy. Our correspondent Dan Rivers reports. The British former spy at the centre of the dossier on Donald Trump remains in hiding tonight, but his intelligence gathering continues to cause reverberations around the world. Today, the Prime Minister wouldn't be drawn on whether it was compiled with the help of British spy agencies. It's a long-standing position that we don't uh, comment on such matters, but I think what, from everything that you will have seen, it is absolutely clear that the individual who produced this dossier has not worked for the UK government for years. The man who compiled the dossier, Christopher Steele, was an MI6 agent posted to Moscow in the early 1990s. He left the secret intelligence service and set up a private firm helping clients do business in Russia in 2009. After 2010, ITV News understands while working for the FA, he came across information which he would later share with the FBI. It formed part of their investigation into FIFA, which led to a series of raids and eventually the downfall of FIFA president Sepp Blatter. It further cements Christopher Steele's reputation as a reliable and thorough investigator. But today Donald Trump sought to undermine Christopher Steele in a tweet saying, It now turns out that the phony allegations against me were put together by my political opponents and a failed spy afraid of being sued. Are you passing information to the Americans, sir? And now into this ever more complex story steps Sir Andrew Wood, no. former British ambassador to Moscow, who denies passing the dossier on to the Americans when America. discussing its contents with Senator John McCain. 
but he has described Christopher Steele as a competent professional operator. Tonight, ITV News understands Christopher Steele is still in the UK, a man who's angered both the Russians and the president-elect of the United States. He's understandably trying to keep his head down. Dan Rivers, ITV News. A teenager accused of murdering seven-year-old Katie Ruff has appeared before Leeds Crown Court. The girl, who is 15, appeared via video link and didn't speak during the hearing. Katie was found with severe injuries near a playing field in York on Monday. She died later in hospital. And police searching for RAF airman Corey McKeague are still trying to trace six witnesses filmed on CCTV the night he disappeared. The 23-year-old was last seen in Bury St Edmunds in September. Now, it's been exactly six months since Theresa May took over as Conservative leader, but so far she's given little detail on how she's going to approach Brexit. But that should change next week when the Prime Minister gives a speech on her negotiating aims. In the first of our series, Brexit Britain, our political correspondent Paul Brand hears the view from Basingstoke. In Basingstoke, they make a little bit of everything. We make things that go in and out, up and down, round and round. OK, simple. Simple, yeah. <laughs> From car parts to cancer scanners, this engineering firm can tackle most things, including Brexit. The boss didn't vote to leave, but he's accepted it, if only he knew what it means for his exports. I just need a decision. Um, whether it's hard, soft, let's just get, get something sorted. I can understand the delays because they feel it might weaken their negotiating position, but as a business moving forward, we need to know what to do. Not many of his workers followed the boss's advice. How do you vote in the referendum? Uh, I voted to leave. Oh. And six months into her job, they also want the Prime Minister to deliver, but they have no regrets. I can see myself now buying a house and not struggling as much and having more of a future than there was. Do you think you're going to get what you want, what you voted for? Yeah, well, I voted out, so we're coming out. That's, at the end of the day, if it doesn't work out, I voted out, so I'll deal with the consequences. That's... That was my opinion, that was my vote. He's one of the 52% who voted out here. Brexit divided Basingstoke in exactly the same split as the national result. This 1960s new town rejecting the old order. In a town built for incomers, recent immigration does come up here. So too does the economy. But the one thing people keep telling us they want more than anything from the new Prime Minister is just any kind of plan. A major speech on Tuesday may deliver a few snippets, but everywhere there's impatience. Taking too long and, and too hesitant, basically. Decisions being made by the country, draw a line and, and move on. Very up in the air, not knowing what's going to happen and how things are going to change. And how it's going to affect the future of our, our kids, because we've got more yeah, exactly, young ones, yeah. and is it going to give them the same freedom that we've had? So whether young or old, leave or remain, people here have given the Prime Minister six months in the new job and now they want to see her long-term contract for the coming years. Paul Brandt, ITV News, Basingstoke. And finally, the glamorous life and career of Lord Snowden was remembered today as he died aged 86. His marriage to Princess Margaret was often in the headlines. So too was their marital problems and eventual divorce. But he stayed close to the royal family and took some of their most iconic photographs and those of countless celebrities, as Juliet Bremner reports. The first commoner to marry into royalty for more than 400 years. Anthony Armstrong Jones broke many of the established rules when he married Princess Margaret in 1960. They were the it couple of their generation. Ironically, the professional photographer, now himself the centre of paparazzi attention. In many ways, they defined a fast changing decade. On the back of a motorbike one day, being introduced to some of the most famous faces of the 60s the next. They hung out with um, film stars. A lot of the luminaries of the day were their friends. They had fantastic parties. They, uh, they were just a very glamorous couple. I can't think of their equivalent today. He and Princess Margaret remained together for 16 years and had two children, but their marriage failed amid rumours of affairs. One of the first royal couples to divorce. But he was first and foremost a photographer, taking some iconic pictures of his own wife, but with access to other members of the royal family too, perhaps most notably Princess Diana. 
Two great photographers, David Bailey and Lord Snowden, were recently brought together by Vogue magazine to review their work. He looks rather good. Yeah. Looks better there than he does now, that's for sure. <laughs> Some of his finest work, including portraits of Bowie, the actress Helen Mirren and his early reportage, now hang in the National Gallery. It is the quality and breadth of his work he would want to be remembered for. Tributes to Lord Snowden, who died today aged 86. Well, that's all from us for now. Julie Etchingham will be here with the news at 10. But for me and all of the team here, have a very good evening. Goodbye.